Hello, I'd, I'd first like to thank um, Sanjay and Michael for inviting me to talk here today. Um, I've been asked to talk about the psychological impact of screening. Um, in this talk today, I'm going to uh, talk a bit about screening as part of healthcare, why there is cardiovascular screening. We've touched upon some of the points within the previous talk, so I won't go over those in detail. Um, what, are, what is the psychological impact of screening in general in the literature? What are some of the problems with the research? How can this be applied to adolescents? What does genetics have to add? What about false positives? They're a big issue um, within any screening program. Why it might be important to look at this using a theoretical framework uh, before concluding. So over 50 years, screening for disease and estimating disease risk has been, uh, using biomarkers has been part of routine healthcare. However, until a paper in 1978 in the New England Journal of Medicine, which showed there was an increase in absenteeism after the identification of hypertension, the emotional impact of screening had largely been unquestioned. The psychological costs are now considered as part of the net benefit of any screening program. We need systematic screening programs to establish the prevalence of these diseases, and as Professor Sharma has talked about, there are a number of reasons why this is now in place. Well, something which was not been mentioned is actually symptoms are often arbitrary, and when you present to the primary care, they will very easily be dismissed. Breathlessness, maybe less so with chest pain, but breathlessness, palpitations, these are also anxiety symptoms. So very quickly people can be told not to worry, to go away. But actually there is some concern for the individuals who have had those symptoms, and they may not be happy with that. Great headline, this in the BMJ editorial in 1997, uh, screening could seriously damage your health, um, in which they talked about the social and psychological costs that need to be evaluated. There is a general perception by lay people and experts that screening for disease has an adverse emotional impact. The small number of lives saved does not justify the anxiety that is raised through the procedure. Psychological distress can occur at each stage of the screening process from the invitation to the test result. So there is a need to examine the potential distress in people with normal results as well as false positives. Here we've got um, a bit of scale. I would like to have this jigging around, balancing backs and forwards, but that wasn't possible. But you've got some of the complexity of the debate because some of the research says there's raised anxiety, some says it reduces anxiety. On one hand, it raises a health preoccupation. On the other hand, it can offer reassurance or back to inappropriate reassurance on the other side. Then you have relief from uncertainty as a benefit. Um, there are false positives, of course, abnormalities being identified. Um, and as far as cost, there may be discrimination in employment and insurance. It's not a pleasant experience to be diagnosed with a disease. We like that at CRY. We like to identify people at risk, but the individuals are not happy about that, obviously. Then there are financial costs of the testing process. But on the benefits, we actually we have the potential to prevent a sudden cardiac death. And we touched on that today, well, we were in depth really. The impact of a sudden death is just not an individual dying, it's the impact on the entire wider family, the, the parents, the siblings, the children, the grandparents, the wider community. It's a very powerful, uh, terrible impact that it does have. As well as assisting in lifestyle decisions, individual freedom to avoid certain medications which may trigger a drug. We often see screening as black and white, but this is about probability and the way in which you live your life and you may avoid certain things which could trigger an event. The majority of the studies which have informed the previous slide are, have a lot of methodological problems. There are retrospective questioning often with recall bias, their use of instruments previously not validated, often single item measures lack of control groups or comparisons with population norms. The time intervals are sporadic. Um, few studies take a measurement at the time of the results and rarely are suitable baseline measures taken. Often the first evaluation is just immediately before the test, at which point the psychological issues have already started. When we step back a little bit and we look at the reviews of the emotional impact, actually few report any effects on generalized specific anxiety, depression, quality of life. Few reports, few studies report distress that is sustained in the longer term, even in the most extreme scenarios with breast cancer, where it's a, a horrendous experience to be called back for further tests. When you look back a year later, actually it's a positive experience. People look at these experiences in a very positive way. Um, it's not to say that individual studies do not identify some problems. I'm not saying that these studies do, but it's when you look back at the reviews. Um, and very recently, a meta-analysis, randomized control studies, the sort of studies the National Screening Committee would want to see, 
have actually shown that screening does not appear to have any adverse emotional impacts in the longer term, more than four weeks. And actually, there are too few studies to assess the outcomes before four weeks to comment on the shorter term emotional impact. Much of the research in this area is focused on cancer and older populations. This is profoundly different from the groups that we're looking at. Physiological differences in younger people, different prognostic implications, and very different psychological factors. When we introduce then athletes, we, we have another category. So there is a career requirement for some people, or, or in pilots, um, versus a personal choice to be tested. We're very keen on offering personal choice, but some people don't have that choice. And on one hand, you might have athletes who are, uh, they've got a lot to lose if identified with a condition. They've invested a lot into that career often. However, they're also pretty cool about things often. They have a lot of tests, and in, in a way, by mandating it, making it routine, it is normalized for them as one of the many tests which could have an impact on their selection within a team. I'm not going to try and pronounce this, I'm going to call it FAP, because I always mess up the middle bit, but in this area, um, looking at adolescents, this is one of the few studies that has done that, children with negative results had anxiety scores significantly lower than US norms when going through screening for this. Um, anxiety decreased over time for those receiving negative results. The authors said this may be because young people have less understanding of the social implications of the test result, like obtaining a mortgage, passing on the condition, or also that the threat is in the future, it's further in the future and perceived as less threatening to the individual. What does genetic testing have to add? These are not genetic tests in a pure sense, but we are in similar way, like genetic testing, offering tests for conditions that are often genetic, um, and we're introducing a potential risk into an individual's life, which was not there until the testing occurred. However, when you look at the reviews, review paper on this, None of the papers report increased distress in the carriers or non-carriers at any point during the 12 months after the testing. And this was general and situational distress, anxiety, and depression. The, these are the sort of areas the psych psychological literature is often focused on, anxiety in particular. It's not a great study, this, but it was really the first study which introduced ECG screening. Um, as I say, retrospective me measures, non-validated, small sample of adolescents performed in a dental clinic. But the majority of participants found it valuable, easy, non-intrusive. A more recent study, a great sample for the population of footballers to get them to engage in this sort of study uh, with Eric Solberg. Majority of participants felt more confident when playing, satisfied having completed the screening, would strongly recommend it to others. There were concerns which focused mainly around actually their career and the investment, their identity as, uh, as elite athletes. I think what's really important here is we have top-down policy and there's lots of reasons why we have that within football and other sports. But when you're introducing screening at the highest level, you're introducing a test which does have an impact on the career of an individual. And I think there is some responsibility to at least make the wider population down to grassroots available about that. So the individuals are being screened out at a time when they've not invested their emotions into becoming a great footballer, and they've not invested economically into that. Because that is, that is a tough thing, telling any elite athlete. And it's tough uh, as well, because you know, the chances of sudden death may be small against incredible lucrative rewards by continuing in that professional career. So I think the message there is you want to screen people out at a young age before you've inherited a very significant issue at a later stage, if that's possible. I'd like to talk a little bit about our, the work we did at Cardiac Risk in the Young, the prospective investigation of the psychological response to screening. We looked at our school program, we looked at the community program, which actually was more focused around a, often a sudden death in the local community. Um, but we also had a comparison group who didn't undergo the cardiac testing control group. We looked at people when they had an invitation to become, when they were invited, did their informed consent to the screening, Time two, immediately before the testing. Time three, after they received the result. And then at time four, for a number of follow-ups. A small group who were followed up um, who had abnormal findings. At the, the main test which followed through this was the HADS anxiety questionnaire. HADS anxiety questionnaire is, um, is a great test. It's well validated, used with adolescents, used with university students. Um, it's a short measure, seven items. Um, it's not contaminated by symptoms. And we're, as I'll come to, the, these conditions often present with people with arbitrary symptoms. So that was the main measure we were looking at throughout the screening. But we also um, looked at self-rated health, very powerful measure, single item, 
physical functioning on a number of time intervals. And then at time one, modified illness perception questionnaire. This enabled us to understand how people perceive these conditions in the screening environment, looking at things like consequences, timeline, cure, how much they actually understood what they're involved in. But you also had um, at time three, information and reassurance scales, which have been previously validated in a study. Uh, we did um, open-ended questions to find out really what they were thinking uh, about the test. And similarly, information and reassurance scales at time four. The control group had the anxiety scale and the self-perception, uh, self-rated health scale. Um, I don't think I need to talk too much about this, but this were the sample sizes breaking down the adolescents. The majority of people in the study were adolescents and 128 people in the comparison group. What we found was there is a significant effect on time on those people. This is just adolescents now, um, 209 people who um, completed at time one, time two, and time three anxiety scale. Um, there was a significant effect of time on anxiety levels, which would stay the same between time one and two, but significantly dropped at time three. Why did this occur? Um, it could have been that it was an inaccurate baseline measure. So at time one, we didn't actually, uh, they'd already received a questionnaire. It's very difficult to get a good baseline measure before someone has any information about what they're going to be involved in. And it can only really be possible if you're part of maybe a, a GP surgery where you've already given out these questionnaires before any impending offer of screening. So it was possible, but hopefully that wasn't the case the way the design of the scale is. The HAD anxiety scale is meant to actually um, look at the previous period of time. So it should have been an accurate baseline measure. Then did actually, uh, did this reduction in anxiety at time three reflect some sort of reduced anxiety in general, which would be very nice to say that everyone who goes through the cry screening program is gonna feel better for the rest of their lives afterwards and less anxious. I don't think that's the case. I expect it was to return back to normal baseline levels at a later date, but we didn't follow that up. It wasn't possible within this study. Um, there are other factors about this time two, we would have expected a significant hike just before people are about to have a test, which may have made them nervous. Um, you would have expected their anxiety to rise. It didn't happen, and why might that have been the case? Quality of staff interactions may have been good. Quality of information may have reassured them that that was not um, something they needed to worry about. There were no needles, non-invasive tests, so the actual test itself was unlikely to cause much anxiety in the individual, unlike some screening measures. The importance of this table is really to show that the people who participated had un unusually low levels of anxiety. Now, that is important because we want all people to participate within the screening and we don't know what the impact is of those people who have normal levels of anxiety or higher levels of anxiety. So that's what we're talking about, is people with lower normals of le uh, levels of anxiety. And this was compared, as I said, against um, well-established uh, studies with anxiety in, uh, in school children, university students, and against the control group. So why was this the case? As I said earlier, sometimes anxiety stops people from engaging in uh, testing or health preventative action, but sometimes, Anxiety actually gets you to do things. It, it, it's a positive, uh, uh, it's something very important for us to make us act and not just stay in bed, um, get out and do something we don't really want to do. Um, also, this was a hypothetical study. There was no actual testing, but anxiety was identified as one of the main reasons against genetic testing for breast cancer in adolescents. So maybe there are some clues there. Furthermore, the decision-making process may have been influenced by many factors other than anxiety, parental influence, peer pressure, advice from athletic trainers. So maybe mum or dad at home are absolutely terrified. Well, their 16-year-old son is, you know, he's not worried about this at all. There was one great response saying that my mum bullied me into the testing from one of the respondents. And I think that does summarise there is going to be some parental pressure. And should we be looking at parents um, rather than just focusing on those people who are engaged in the process? Symptoms, as I said, it's difficult with symptoms because there is this overlap with um, anxiety, but they're an unlo unusually low anxiety group, and yet over 60% of them said they had one or more of the symptoms in this sample. Um, 
The presence of symptoms was associated with higher levels of anxiety at baseline measure, but also higher levels of anxiety throughout the testing. So I, I think it's just important to note that, that people who are symptomatic are more anxious. Is that because they are more anxious that that is an anxiety symptom or not? We don't know. False positives. I, I think it would be wrong not to talk about false positives um, in a talk looking at the psychological issues. Um, at the very least, this is considered an undesirable side effect of a program. However, as I've said, the negative impact of a false positive is short term, usually. It disappears in the long term. It, for our doctors, I know it's very concerning when a mother or a father calls up and says, my son's been called back for further tests. And they're very anxious, as well as attending in a clinic. People will be very anxious at times. But that does, in general, based on the research, that disappears in the long term. The false positives in our study um, showed that they, the participants were satisfied with the information. Less than 50% reported concerns about being called back. They understood why they were being called back. They realized it didn't mean they necessarily had a problem, but we just needed to look into this further. Anxiety was not a problem with any of the people. This is nine people. It wasn't a massive sample. We would like much larger samples than that. Um, they had a positive outlook on the screening program, and they would recommend it to their friends. Interestingly, as is the case with all these open-ended questions, especially when there's a potential for retrospective questions, at time four, many of the people who said they had no worries were relieved that there was nothing wrong. So I think there is an issue of false positives, and any program can actually try and address this as well as possible, and it has directed the way we've developed our programs at CRI to minimize false positives. So, there is both an economic and a, an emotional cost, be it short-lived. Um, and the economic cost is, you know, you're not bringing people into the NHS for ultrasound tests. This was the time when we were just doing ECGs and then calling people back for ultrasound at a later date. So now we provide an echo on the day. We bring the false positives down to 4%. And uh, those people who are brought back have abnormalities which do need to be investigated and would, if they've been identified in any general practice clinic, need to be investigated. What does, most of the research is pragmatic and atheoretical. Um, we looked at the common sense model of illness representations. This, I could talk about this for hours, but what this did is breaks down cognitive and emotional representations. It looks how, how people perceive the identity of having the disease, the causes of the disease, the consequences of the disease, the timeline of the disease, how, how, whether it can be cured or controlled, and how this would interplay with anxiety in the process. Now, people had a very powerful, strong sense of the consequences of these conditions. They, were, they, they understood that it was a very serious issue to be identified with one of these conditions. Now, what was interesting was this had no relationship with their anxiety level whatsoever. So although they understood it, um, the conditions, and that's a very good sign for informed consent because some of the criticisms of screening programs is you get people to engage, you almost coerce them into the room without explaining to them what it means to have a diagnosis. Now by looking at using a theoretical model you could establish this. You could really look closely at what they were thinking and how they were emotionally responding to the process. So that's just one of the areas that taking a theoretical perspective and being able to compare it to other conditions like cancer, it was much more significant than cancer patients who are involved in second stage of cancer screening, the way they perceive the consequences. So I found that interesting. Now the impact on those diagnosed. I, I've focused this talk on people going through the screening process. That's really where one of the key debates in this is when you talk to the National Screening Committee or other bodies. And that's, it's not necessarily the people who are identified with conditions. We would expect someone to have difficulties adjusting to a condi uh, any of these conditions, long QT, lo hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, back in 97, I worked with Professor McKenna at St. George's and Professor Andrew Steptoe, and we, it was the first study to look at hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and the quality of life. There were wide variations in reported symptoms. The adjustment to the condition was variable. There were perceived quality of interactions with clinical staff influenced their quality of life. Patients were more anxious than cancer patients. This is interesting, and it's been replicated recently in, in uh, genetics, nature, uh, in Australia. And uh, it is interesting, it's important. But all of the patients in this service were actually either highly symptomatic, um, had had a sudden death within their family, or were related to other of the two parties after a condition had been identified. 
So we can't really draw any conclusions about that being the impact of someone being identified through a screening, a proactive screening program. However, there is some evidence, children with ad adolescents with ICDs, although they'll suffer from physio physical functioning issues, um, the psychosocial functioning is not impaired when they're given the correct support. Um, after ablation treatment, it can be seen that there's reduction in the fear of their heart problem and increase in the things that they enjoy. Small samples of these, they need to be replicated in much bigger data. But that is the principle behind the Cry My Heart Network. It's about providing the correct support, giving people good understanding of why they have um, the condition and why it's important that they respond in the way they do to these diagnoses. So what is the impact on those diagnoses of screening program? We need much larger samples before we can start doing that. And CRI can probably do that now. The number of people we're screening is way in excess of 30,000 over the last 10, 15 years. Um, and we need to address this. Um, how do parents and adolescents respond to being in the gray zone? As Professor Sharma has said, there's very few of those. And I would see those moving into the area of actually a diagnosis or receiving information which actually will limit the chance of having a sudden cardiac death. I wouldn't see them as a false positive or a negative outcome of the screening program. So in conclusion, cardiac screening does not appear to have a negative psychological impact on those who participate. Participants had lower levels of anxiety than non-participants in the sample that we looked at. And um, non-participants may have responded very differently to the screening process. I think just important to note that um, there has been a change. A lot of this work was conducted five, ten years ago. And in recent times, we've seen with the collapse of Fabrice, I know his name's come up a number of times, but it did actually have a very strong effect on our screening program. There was a massive surge of interest into the screening program. And it might be interesting now to look at how those sorts of events actually influence people's perceptions going through the screening program. Furthermore, some of the re research with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the impact of being diagnosed, was at a time when there was very little understanding of these conditions in the lay public and actually the wider community both well, in the medical community. So maybe we need to readdress this again uh, within the UK samples to see whether the educational programs, the massive advances we've made in this area is actually having an impact on people who are diagnosed with these conditions. Thank you very much for listening.